coming up on Garden Talk. Bone meal breaks down a little slower compared to fish bone meal. So if you're going to add for bloom, flower, getting the fruit, blood meal is one you want to add kind of in that transition over from your veg into the flower state. It's beneficial, but it's really helping more the biology. They say it's helping the terpenes. I didn't see an improvement in the terpenes to me when I used the product. If you don't have protozoa or the other biology that help eat the bacteria and fungi, your nutrients are being locked up and stored up. They're not being helpful to the plant. Micro macronutrients are very important because without this, we don't have certain balances happening within the plant. They can't stay in a homeostasis. If they're low on something, it's going to cause them to start reacting differently. What's up, everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, a.k.a. Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Guard Talk Podcast. This is episode number 65. In this episode, I interview Medically Fit. He was on this podcast once before, episode 13, and he talked all about organic dry amendments that you can use in your garden. That episode currently has over 73,000 plays, and there were many comments left on that episode from people requesting a part two. So in this episode, we continue where we left off and go over some more organic dry amendments that you can use in your garden. Thanks to all of you who support this podcast through Patreon. If you'd like to support, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash mrgrowit. Before we get into it, I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring zero cost for information about gardening, all plants, to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. A big supporter of this podcast is AC Infinity. They sponsor this podcast and I use their products. AC Infinity now has gardening tools and accessories such as heavy duty fabric grow pots, trimmers, grow room glasses, drying racks, plant ties, and trellis nets. They also have all of the equipment needed for a ventilation system. I will leave a link to AC Infinity down in the description section below, and you can use discount code MrGrowIt during checkout for a discount on their products. Thanks to Spider Farmer for being a sponsor. A new grow light they released here in 2022 is the SE1000W. This was designed specifically for those of you who run CO2 in your grow space and really want to maximize the light intensity. It has a 10 bar design for an even light spread, pulls 1000 watts from the wall, and comes in at 2.9 micromoles per joule efficacy. The recommended coverage area is 4 feet by 4 feet or 5 feet by 5 feet. Use discount code MrGrowIt5 to save on all Spider Farmer products, and I'll leave a link in the video description section below. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk podcast. Today I am joined with Medically Fit. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Uh, just got off work and had to rush home to kind of get ready for this. Nice, nice. Well, you are back for a second time. I'm sure a lot of people recognize you from the first time around. That was way back in episode 13. It was actually uh, released May 8th, 2021. And that episode has over 73,000 views. Uh, I know there was a ton of people in the comment section demanding a part two. They wanted you back for a part two. So uh, you're actually the first reoccurring guest on this podcast to do a part two. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so last time around, we talked about pretty much like dry amendments that you can use in your garden. Uh, we covered, uh, I have a list here, gypsum, azomite, rock phosphate, langaminite, dolomite lime, oyster shell. Uh, we talked about how to brew teas, green sand, humic acids, biolive, and bokashi. So uh, for those tuning into this episode right now, you do not need to go back and watch that episode first. You can definitely still continue to tune into this episode, but I'll definitely have a link to that past episode in the YouTube description section below. So maybe after this video, you can tune in on that video and uh, see some additional amendments that uh, you can use in your garden. Or for you that's already seen it, here's part two. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, we're going to continue to talk about the organic dry amendments to use in your garden. Um, for those that don't know who you are, can you do a quick introduction yeah, so I am a living soil cultivator. I've uh, been cultivating since uh, mid 2000, 2010, 11-ish, uh, when I lived out in Las Vegas, Nevada. And ever since then, I have continued to kind of research and want to know more and more about the plant and about the soil. Uh, I look at it being like a symbiotic relationship of one. So I wanted to know more about it. 
And so it set me on my journey and my YouTube kind of video creation of just putting out videos for like video logs for myself. And it turned into more than that. Okay, so let's pick up where we left off talking about the various amendments or organic inputs to use. Let's start with alfalfa meal. Can you talk to us about that? What is it? What are the benefits? And how do you apply it to your garden? So alfalfa meal is basically the byproduct of them breaking down alfalfa for either feed or essential oil extract, uh, fatty extracts, things like that. And what you can use it for is to kind of feed your plants. Um, it still has <clears throat> plenty of the NPKs. It's got some micro macronutrients. Um, it also has a hormone called tricantinol. And tricantinol is really a plant growth regulator or plant growth hormone. <clears throat> it helps the plant finish a little faster. It helps with some of the root root uh, expansion. Um, but alfalfa, it uh, it kind of helps with the soil amendment, uh, building the biology. The they like to break it down. It helps with some protozoa, uh, especially if you do it in a tea. Um, so alfalfa meal is really great. I like to, I like to use it throughout my whole grow, uh, feeding my plants. Uh, but <clears throat> when my plants are going into fruit flower stage, sometimes I bump it up a little bit more, trying to help them ripen a little faster, finish up a little faster. Uh, something about the tricantinol seems to help them do that a little bit. So I can har say harvest my tomatoes a little bit quicker than say the 45 50 days it might i might be able to do it a little sooner and what's the application rate for that uh application rate is like a tablespoon per gallon um, but if you're doing a top dress sometimes you have a five gallon pot so you you probably use you know a couple tablespoons um, if you're making a super soil depends on the cubic foot because then you're talking a couple cups to you know three and a half to six cups uh you can make it into a tea uh down to earth likes to state that you can't make teas out of their products but it's a soluble you can um it breaks down over time so you can extract and make uh teas with them so there's uh three different ways you could really apply it you can actually do a foliar spray if you wanted to and apply it that way Awesome. I actually mixed in some alfalfa with my Fox Farm Ocean Forest soil. So it's a bag soil and that's already, uh, you know, quote, hot soil, right? So it's already got tons of amendments yeah, in there. Yeah. And so uh, a lot of people were surprised that I added in alfalfa with it. I actually added in alfalfa and insect frass. And uh, we'll get into insect frass here in a little bit. But um, I had to, I got some really, really good results off of that. And that was just the veg stage, right? Um, but it wasn't too hot. And um, I did hear that alfalfa meal in particular, somebody had mentioned that you should avoid using it in flour for some reason. Is that just bro science? As far as I understand, it's bro science. I've never had a problem using alfalfa in, in my flower stage ever. And I've used it 10 plus years more. And I, I highly talk about it in a lot of the videos about using alfalfa and tricantinol, especially in flour, to help them finish up quicker. Um, in a living soil uh, bed, my plants seem to really start finishing anywhere around day 50 to 60. 63, to me, it's almost going over where the point I like, but that's kind of what that does. And what tricantinol as a plant growth regulator kind of helps the plant do. It's supposed to help it finish supposed to ripen i think a lot of people hear plant growth regulators or pgrs and they kind of uh they proceed with caution right because there is a pgr out there that is uh known as a carcinogen right yes well and that's the one thing the difference between organic and other products that are chemically changed to get that that hormone um with organics, most of, most of these are natural plant like cytokines and auxins and uh, tricantinol. These all 
happen within the plant. And they're all organically part of the plant. So there's not much you can do to get away from them using these. And it's not in the sense like, hey, I'm going out and I'm finding this bottle of this plant growth regulator to help my plant just do all this crazy growth. No, that's not the purpose of it. That makes sense. Let's move on to back guano. So it's something that's uh, very commonly used. I know there's a ton of different guanos. Back guano in particular seems to be very popular. Um, I, I believe that it's high in nitrogen. Can you talk to us about back guano, kind of, you know, what it is, the benefits, application rates, so on and so forth? Yeah, so you have back guano and you have sea guano. Both of them are high in nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, back guano, it's... You're looking at it as the bat is more of an herbivore eating small insects and bugs compared to um, like seabirds. Seabirds, they can eat different, like not just small, they'll eat fish, um, you know, different insects, sometimes small animals, uh, just depends on the, the seabird. Um, but the... The bat guano, a lot of people look for it to use a lot in the flower, helping with soil biology. Um, it helps with the soil biology because they like the guanos. They like the, the frass, the poop, the manure. Um, manures are higher in nitrogen, higher in phosphorus. And that's where a lot of people like those, especially in flower. I personally don't use a lot of guanos. I've always felt that they gave my plant kind of an odd taste um, and I wasn't sure if it was the guano itself or the cure method but when I took it out of like my super soil recipe I don't get that same taste that I used to get using guanos so some people do some people don't use it it just depends on your preference and down to earth they have one right yep they have one theirs is Something like a 731, I think, something like that. Okay, gotcha. How about blood meal? Can you talk to us about that? Blood meal, if you're veganic or vegan, you don't want to use blood meal. It's made by animal byproducts. Blood meal is fast acting um, like an amino acid type nitrogen um, that if you're top feeding, your plants are making it into a tea it's going to help your plants uh, take up nitrogen a little faster compared to say like feather meal where it's a slower breaking down um, amendment versus the blood meal so if I put blood meal in my pot I can expect within a week to two weeks it's pretty well broken down into the soil and the biology starting to break it down allowing the plant to uptake it there is some solubility to it, so when you do put it with water or top dress and add water, some of it's going to get released right away so your plants can utilize it. But to me, it's one of the things that I do use, uh, especially in my veg state. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this is one of the amendments where there's quite a bit of controversy around it as far as people talk about organic, organic amendments, and they're like, well, blood meal isn't organic because of the source and, you know, what were the animals fed and so on and so forth. Is that right? That's part of it. So here's my response. Everything's organic chemistry when it breaks down. It's organic in nature. It's carbon-based. So these amendments that are carbon-based, and all of these are carbon-based, and that's kind of a source of nutrients our plants need. Um, I like that versus hey it's came from a cow and it was slaughtered and it went through this whole horrible process just to get it um well the cow is going to be slaughtered anyhow for the butcher to produce meat for people that want to eat it this is some of the byproducts that they're just going to throw away so instead of it sitting there decomposing bringing in bad pathogens they're using it and breaking it down and making it into uh, an amendment or something that you can use to 
top dress your you know your soil and help condition your soil because the biology they love it they really like what it does uh, it really helps them with um, getting that ready to be taken up by the plants bone meal is next on the list and i could imagine there's some similarities between blood meal and bone meal can you talk to us about bone meal yeah, so there's a couple different types of bone meal. You have bone meal, then you have fish bone meal. Both of them are pretty high in phosphorus. That's one of them that I really enjoy using. Um, bone meal breaks down a little slower, like a slower release phosphorus compared to fish bone meal. So it's a great deal that if you're going to add for bloom, flower, getting the fruit, Bone meal is one you want to add kind of in that transition over from your veg into your flower and into the flower state because plants are really looking for phosphorus and that's really a good source for them to find it. That's to me a nice organic. Um, you, there's other amendments you can use still for phosphorus, but bone meal or fish meal, um, I like them. I, I, I think what the biology in the soil how it helps them beneficially is the reaction I'm looking for and not so much that, oh, it's derived from a fish or it's derived from an animal, you know, from bones. Bone meal is more that phosphorus. You still have some nitrogen to it, but it's more that phosphorus. And that's when your plants are producing the fruits, flowers, and they're looking for that phosphorus and not just potassium. And so that's where adding that to me, like in that transition, uh, from veg over in the flower state and then into flower uh, first couple weeks is uh, a good recommendation for it. Not so much, not, not, I mean, plants like phosphorus for helping with like rooting and other growth, but to me it's not crucial where, you know, you're looking for certain flowers to develop and be dense and full. And so like certain points of, a plant's growth in their life cycle, it's you're trying to hit certain nutrients, trying to help with that. So they they get a better production during, a, you know, like the tomato wanting to produce more tomato spots or starts. That's kind of what I mean by that. More sites. Yeah, one thing I learned is that phosphorus, uh, you know, you hear about it being uptaken and flowering. It's actually part of the biomass, right? So the, the actual flowers are mostly phosphorus. So... Um, yeah, very important. How about cottonseed meal? Now, cottonseed meal, it's derived kind of like alfalfa. It's it's a byproduct. Um, there's some trace minerals to it, not a lot of NPK. There's a little bit. Um, but it's mainly like protein. And proteins are what? Amino acids when they're broken down. And so that's where I'm looking at it from – it's good to add for the soil conditioning to help build the soil biology. Plant use, it's, it's like the amino acids that plants are looking for to help like the building blocks of leaf tissue and cell development and things like that. So it's a great use. But do the plants actually uptake the amino acids? It's got to be broken down. So that's where the biology really helps out. Uh, your plants still take up amino acids like uh, Key to Life makes a product called Green 9, which is an amino acid nitrogen complex um, that it's soluble. So it will take up um, just add it in water and water it in or even top dress. Cottonseed meal, similar to that, it's it's not so soluble like this powder form, the Green 9. But once the water hits it and the biology kind of breaks it down, it's going to make it plant available in amino acid form. Now, is it safe to use throughout the entire grow, or should you only use it in veg or only use it in flower, for example? I would use it through veg and partial flower, like the beginning stages, and kind of wean off. Because you're not going to, your plants don't seem to use, in my opinion, the amount of amino acids laid in flower as they do during flower development. Okay, gotcha. Let's move on to crab meal. What is crab meal, and what are the benefits of it? So crab meal is similar to like what oyster shell is. It's the crust up like outer shells of crab. Um, it's kind of like chitinase, chitin, in a sense. How do I want to describe it? 
because the oyster shell has a lot of like calcium to it. So this is going to be similar, but crab is similar to like crustacean meal. Um, they both help with the salicylic jasmonic kind of part of the plant, the self-defense mechanism because of chitinase. Um, they're great for calcium. Um, so when your plant's looking for calcium uptake, especially during bloom, flower, uh, fruit production, uh, it's that's really when it's going to be kind of like beneficial, um, getting more calcium into the soil. Or it's better to kind of mix it up. It's harder to make it into a tea. Uh, it takes way too long to break down. Like anything that's like a calcium, a crust, a shell, it's hard. And so it's going to take a while to break down, similar to what egg is. So like a lot of people use egg, for example, and like compost. Well, when you're doing the whole shell, it takes a while for that all that calcium to be broken down and the biology to actually break it up. It's similar with crab meal, crustacean meal. What is the application rate for that? I imagine that like a lot of these products – I think a lot of folks are used to bottled nutrients and having to do like a half dose, for example, but a lot of these organic amendments, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that you can generally go by what it says on the instructions. Is that true or false? I would agree with that. The reason being is they all break down a little differently. So when you're doing bottled nutrients, you're it's readily available right then. With adding dry, or men, dry organic amendments, it takes while. The biology actually has to break a lot of it down. It's not soluble. Like the percentage on some of these products are like 2 to 3% soluble. The other 90 some percent is insoluble. It has to be broken down. And so if I'm taking a tablespoon per gallon, which is five milliliters, you know, for bottle, it's still pretty much the same ratio. It's just in a dry form. I'm going to have to try to figure out how to make it spread evenly where, it, you know, when you mix fertilizer up in water, it, it kind of, you can mix it a little bit evenly through the water, but not the soil, you know, compared to a dry amendment. So that's the application to me would be pretty spot on. Um, sometimes depending on the nitrogen source, I think it could be a little high. Uh, I think blood meal, uh, if you're adding that to with other nitrogen sources, you might back off just a little bit. I think you can create a toxicity to it, especially if you're, say, using like neem seed meal and um, kelp and oyster shell, you know, other things that are higher in nitrogen. Then you're to me you're going to really create a toxicity because your nitrogen levels are high, even though they're in different amendment sources, it's still going to be high. So yeah, when it, when you're adding several different sources of nitrogen, yes, I would consider backing off as well. Okay, and then one last thing on crab meal you mentioned earlier, uh, defense. It helps with defense mechanism. I think you said something like that, right? Yep. So. My my question in regards to that would be, I think a lot of people's ears perk up because one of the things with uh, that plants produce as a defense mechanism is trichomes. So does crab meal, <laughs> you know, this may be a dumb question, but uh, does crab meal help with trichome production in that sense? So what the plant does is trichomes are like part of the secondary metabolite issue. Uh, your salicylic, your jasmonic, pathways are some of the stressor pathways that when a, the plant's being attacked by a path pathogen kind of triggers these pathways. Well, these pathways are kind of also releasing these smells like terpenoids, flavonoids, um, that actually will help protect it, either causing the plant to be more stressed out, causing it. So see, trichomes are resinous. So as like a plant, a bug walks on it, it will start to stick to it and kind of trap itself. It's really, if the plant's sick, it's going to be attacked anyhow. 
when the plant's stressed, that's when it's producing the trichomes, the secondary metabolites. That's when it's really, they're talking, it's more active and why it produces more trichomes. So when you create stressors, overwatering, underwatering, uh, changing temperatures, I mean, low environmental stressors can help with production of trichomes. And crab meal it has chitin. And so that itself helps with those metabolites and helps to build kind of those trichomes, the secondary, the stressors that the plant's looking for to do that. Gotcha. Next on the list is crustacean meal. Want to talk to us about that? Yeah, that's going to be similar to crab, just a little different type of crustacean sea animal. Uh, it's going to have a little bit of nitrogen to it, a little uh, like minor micro macro type nutrients to some of it, but it's still going to have chitinates. Uh, the same thing as crab and kind of insect frass. It's going to help with the secondary metabolites in the plant. Um, so using that to help in the soil pre, and I don't believe in top dressing in some of these. I think they take way too long to top dress. Um, I believe if you're going to do it, you maybe scratch it in or kind of try to blend it in a little bit in the top part so the biology really gets all over it to help break it down sooner. Uh, but adding it to like a tea or something, there's not a lot of solubility to it, so it's it's not worth it. So if you really are utilizing crab, crustacean meal, even oyster shell, I recommend doing it in the soil, like a super soil mix. I think it'd probably be beneficial for those folks that are reusing soil over and over again, right? Even though if it doesn't break down in the current growth yes. cycle, well, next growth cycle, it's still in there. It's still breaking down. It can be beneficial. So I think some of these things that you mentioned that take a long time to break down, well, if you're reusing your soil over and over again, then it's certainly a benefit to uh, to use these longer breakdown ones. Soil conditioning, and that's what it's doing, helping condition the soil, helping the biology. It's giving them a surface area to kind of live off of as they're breaking it down, building the colonies. Uh, so it does quite a bit. It's, it's beneficial. Um, that's one thing that I really enjoy about using like crab mill, crustacean mill. There was actually a question in the comment section on the last video we did, and I want to bring it up to you here. Uh, the question is, do plants benefit much from the added fatty acids in crustacean meal? So this is what I, I'm i understanding is that's a yes. And the reason being is because plants produce fat lipids. Biologies, bacteria, they like to break down fats. Doing your compost. If you're adding such things as avocado, that's fat. They love the fats. I mean, you got to understand, like, you can't just dump grease fat from your some of your animals you're cooking. I'm, I'm sure it could be beneficial in small doses. You know, they might enjoy it. But foods that are kind of naturally fatty, oh, yeah, the biology really go crazy. I try to give my plants dairy cream or do it in my compost, which is a fat, the whole milk. Um, there's a lot of fat content to it, but it's also the lactose, the sugars that's with it that they enjoy. So there's two benefits to it. Hmm. Okay, that's good to know. Moving right down the list here, uh, they're in alphabetical order for those of you who haven't caught on just yet. Feather meal, hmm. how about that? Talk to us about feather meal. Feather meal is awesome for long-term use. If you're trying to build a soil that's going to go five, six, seven months, adding something like feather meal to it will help. It's a slow-releasing nitrogen. And so it's going to take its time breaking down and making it available for your plant. And so it's going to go longer in your soil than most your blood meals or knee mills, other sources of nitrogen. It's going to it's gonna be there a little longer. Biology love it. It really helps condition the soil. Um, that would be... So I would mainly try to focus it to 
not work so much during the veg state, but as I'm getting into flower and late in the flower, that's what I'm hoping that the feather meal is going to last that long because I like to do bigger pots, get a bigger root base so my plants can veg a little longer before I start fruiting them because I want the bigger the root, the bigger the fruit, right? If I can get a basket of tomatoes versus just a handful, I think I'm going to take the basket. So if I let my plants veg a little longer so they get a little bit bigger, um, then as they move in the flower, that's what I'm hoping that feather meal at last to get, I get in the flower because my plants still need nitrogen. There's your flowers, your produce, it still needs nitrogen to produce and do the cell division and everything else that it needs to do. I think that's one of the common misconceptions out there is that uh, plants don't need nitrogen in flowering. You hear about, oh, it's heavy in nitrogen for the veg stage, but when the flower stage, you don't need it. That's completely false, right? I mean, they, they need some yes. form of nitrogen. They may, may need more potassium and phosphorus in flowering, but they also still need nitrogen. It's not like nitrogen just completely falls off the map on that one. They still uptake nitrogen, believe it or not, even into late flower. Plants are still looking for it. Absolutely. How about fish hydrolysate? So fish hydrolysate, it's kind of like, it's a processed hydrolysate, which means it's almost like a fat. Most hydrolysates are a type of like a fatty acid in a sense. Um, and the way the amino acids and the kind of like the fatty acids are processed down um, and made into these hydrolysates that are made like kind of plant available. Uh, they have like different proteins, amino acids, peptides to them. Um, but it's, it's a process that, uh, done to the fish to get them to be easily uptaken for plants. Um, they're good, but they can be a negative at the same time. Um, you can overdo the hydrolysate versus some of the meal. Um, so I, I would use a little less. I do like to use it more in a tea versus a, like a top dress or amendment where be the hy hydrolysate is more soluble. It breaks down a lot faster adding it to water. It's like once you add it to water, it kind of like disintegrates and it's readily available. And so – that's where it's great to for a quick feed in your plants because it's great for nitrogen source, amino acids. Uh, but if you go back to like some of the fish meal, it's slower. It doesn't break down the same way. The biology has to kind of break it down over time. So there's a little difference in the hydrolysate versus meals, especially when it comes to that. You also mentioned fish meal along with that fish hydrolysate. Would you say these are pretty pretty similar in the sense of what like the NPK is? Uh, they're just kind of different forms or what? Um, yes. So they have a nitrogen. They have some phosphorus, some potassium, but they have more like the amino acid complex. Okay. So it's a different form of nitrogen more in an amino acid form than it is like a nitrite or nitrate. That's my understanding of it. Okay. And then so for fish meal, when would you typically apply that? Uh, well, fish meal kind of works through a lot of the veg state. Um, you're looking to build that soil. You're looking to build the biology. You want to take up the nitrogen. But as you're getting into flour, that's when I'd kind of start cutting back. I don't need all those amino acids. I'm already having some stuff that has nitrogen that's releasing. I don't need to add more to it. If I'm trying to help with the biology, I might add a little bit, but I'm not going to add a lot. Okay, that's good to know. Moving on to insect frass. So this is something that I use. I know there are a couple types of insect frass. The one I use is uh, black, black soldier insect frass. Mm -hmm. And uh, yep. I know one of the most important things on this is chitin is what it's known for. Can you talk to us about insect frass? What is it? What are the benefits and how you apply it? So this is something I've talked about for many years since insect frass came out with their insect frass. I always kind of followed Subcool's recipe on his 
super soil. And then I really started learning about amendments and learned NSEC frass. NSEC frass is great. It, most of them are either like a 312 or a 222 when it comes to NPK, but most of it's frass. Poop. Another name is guano. So that's where plant bugs eat plants, and so their frass is not. It's more omnivore, not herbivore. It's plant based, where you're eating uh, all this plant tissue. You're eating cytokin. So that's where the cytokin, their shells, like the the exoskeletons, are the cytokins for these bugs. So when they're dying off, their shells are part of the frass as well. And that's where some of the cytokine comes in. Cytokin, um, so insect frass has a couple different brands. Black soldier flies, um, you have different type of mealybugs or different type of bugs um, that they use to kind of harvest the frass. But frass is great for protozoa as well. So when people do soil biology, they talk a lot about bacteria and fungi. They forget about needing protozoa. Protozoa helps eat the bacteria and fungi to release the nutrients that they're storing in their bodies. Insect frass is one of those things that actually has protozoa to it like alfalfa meal. It's kind of in the plant tissue. It, it seems to work its way where it's part of this byproduct that when it's in the water, they kind of start hatching and releasing like they go in a dormant stage and just kind of wait to be hatched in a sense. Uh, but insect frass has always been a great amendment uh, for the cytokine, for what it brings for the biology, because it also brings that bacteria, fungi, and different strains of it to the soil. And that's what you're looking for is a little bit of diversity in soil biology. So insect frass is to me one of the better amendments. Like if you're looking to add just a couple, that would be one of them I would be wanting to add. The cytokine alone that you get just from the frass helps with that trichome development, that secondary metabolism in the plant to fight off pests and pathogens. So it, it's that beneficial. It, to me, it's more beneficial than crab meal, crustacean meal. And correct me if I'm wrong, but there's something in it that helps with resistance to powdery mildew as well. It's the chitin. That's the chitinase. That's the different strains that are in it um, of bacteria that you can do a foliar application that's supposed to help fight off the omyces, the molds, mildews. So definitely super beneficial, especially for those of you who are out there that fight powdery mildew, right? have issues with that. Um, this can be something that you add in as an amendment and could help fight off it. So Yeah, it, to me, like when we were talking about how the crab meal, the crustacean have nitrogen ratios, well, so does insect frost. Those others don't have protozoa to them. Protozoa is one of the parts of the soil food web that you need to have when you're doing gardening outdoors, indoor cultivation, and you're trying to mimic Mother Nature. It's like uh, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and on down. That's the third one in the chart. That's what helps eat the other two. If you don't have protozoa or the other biology that help eat the bacteria and fungi, your nutrients are being locked up and stored up. They're not being helpful to the, the plant. So that's why, to me, it's one of the most beneficials of the crab, crustacean, insect frass. Even I, I'd rather use that over the guanos, and that's what I do. I use both uh, types of insect frass. And I think there's a lot of uh, people who are like, oh, well, I use microbial inoculants. I don't think there's a whole lot of microbial inoculants that have protozoa in it, right? I think it's mostly... There is not. Yeah, right? <laughs> that is correct. Yes. Um, there was a show that we were watching the other day talking about the same problem. What is one of the things missing in most people's soil? Protozoa. Well, protozoa is really key, and there's not a lot of products out there on the market 
that you can buy that are going to retain the protozoa in it like if you did a bottle of nutrient they have it has a shelf life protozoa is only going to live in there so long before they start dying off because they didn't hibernate they thought they were being active kind of that suspended animation type deal once they you know kind of hibernate then they get rehydrated reanimate come back alive and do their job but some of those microbes are dying off right once they go dormant they they die off they don't fully die off but a lot of them it dies back they kind of hibernate a lot of them really hibernate and they found that it it takes either high temperatures or like a major disturbance to kill off most of the biology but for a drought to happen it happens naturally most of them don't all die off they kind of hibernate until the conditions are right before they come alive again same thing with um salmonella e coli they're around you every day it just everything is keeping them at bay until something causes them to get out of hand and out of control and then that's when they become deadly fascinating i didn't know that you would be really surprised that's why a lot of people become uh in fear of bacteria always washing and cleaning and that phobia that's one of the that's why they're oh my god it's really all around me it could kill me at any time <laughs> it's it's sad but it's not as deadly as they make it out to be okay good to know <laughs> moving on to kelp meal talk to us about kelp meal kelp meal is very beneficial it has up to 70 micro macronutrients it has different plant growth regulator plant growth hormones pgrs such as cytokines and auxins also has some gibberellin in it so this is one of them that people really like to push but you have to watch out kelp can have some heavy metals same thing with alfalfa or some of these other amendments but there's ways around that and we can talk about that another time but kelp it's just an all-around one of the better products really for the overall nutrient availability it provides it provides more than two-thirds of these products together with the amount of micro macronutrients the npk to it like that's why a lot of people down to earth most of their bio lines have kelp to them because they really consider it that beneficial to their product that it has so much nutrient to it and its nutrient density that that's why they really look to using it there's not many other amendments that have 70 micro and macronutrients and that's the one thing i preach a lot on my channel is micro macronutrients are very important because without this we don't have certain balances happening within the plant they can't stay in a homeostasis if they're low on something it's going to cause them to start reacting differently and plants need heavy metals despite what we think they need some lead they need some arsenic they need boron but very very trace minute amount like just you know you a droplet's too much if you went like a tenth a hundredth of that maybe but that's that's why kelp is so important is because it has a lot of this what the plant needs in it as humans we need the same thing we need a lot of these trace elements we don't get them in our diet the soil doesn't have it these bottled nutrients they don't have a lot of these trace elements that's why we find that it, using amendments that have higher amounts of trace elements produce a better profile with the plant terpene profile they're healthier because they're getting the full spectrum of elements that they need here but a lot of people are talking about super foods to eat Will we consider this a super amendment for your plants? <laughs> In a sense, yeah. It, it would be something that would be almost like a super amendment. It's one of those that I would put at top of my list above most of these other, other amendments. It's not the end-all be-all, 
I would take a few other amendments over it, but that's me. But this is one of them that if you're not using something like azomite to get the rock dust, the you know the trace minerals from the rock dust, this this is, works great. It helps to get those trace elements in there that you're not getting from the rock dust. We talked about azomite in the previous episode we did together. So once again, that is linked down in the description section below for you guys to tune into that. Let's go over one more and then we will wrap things up. How about neem seed meal? Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, so neem seed meal, it's it's a great product. A lot of people are over-concerned about something called azdiractin. Azdiractin is toxic to bugs. Not humans. It can be if taken in high doses. But azeractin is part of its – how do I want to describe it? It's extracted – so the neem seed meal is a byproduct of different extraction methods pulling uh, some of the oils out of the neem. Um, they use either alcohol or water, but neem's made into so many products – from toothpaste to different um, vitamins that we can take as humans. Uh, people in different countries actually eat some of the neem themselves to help. Um, so it's not bad as people make it out to be. Neem seed meal also helps with bad pathogens and pests that are in the soil. They keep away bad nematodes. So if you have root feeding nematodes, Neem seed will help prevent and keep some of them away from your plants. Neem seed meal is also great when it comes to me, a terpene production. Something about the neem seed, and I'm not sure or heard a lot of people talk about it, but I know when I add a higher concentration of it to my soil, the smell and the aroma I'm getting from my plant. Like it really helps with the flavonoid or the terpene production in those plants. Yeah, I know there is a lot of controversy behind neem in general. And uh, I, I think you hit the nail on the head there with the azadractin is what uh, a lot of people are really complaining about. And uh, like you mentioned, it is commonly used in so many different products. And so... Um, well, their concern is, hey, you're spraying your plants with neem oil. Right. Because you're trying to use it as an IPM. Well, oh, it's systemic. It goes into your plant. It's not systemic. It does not go into the plant cell tissue and stay there. That's not true. What it does is it kind of biodegrades over time. It's just an oil, just like everything else. But they're concerned that it's leaving as direct and as a residue. Well, first of all, are you spraying it on your plant's when they're fruiting or in flower, because most of the time we tell you not to do it then. You don't want to spray your fruits and your, your flowers, your herbs, if you're going to be using them to consume. So you're not going to have a concern of any as a, as direct in residue. But first of all, if you actually read the label and contents, it says there should be none in it. it should be all extracted out. And the minute traces that are left in it, it even will tell you that they will cause harm to bugs, not earthworms, not bigger like birds or other rodents, insects, because of what it does to their reproductive organs, what it does to the exoskeleton. That's the harm. It doesn't do it to us, though. Yes, people have talked about, oh, well, there's deaths in these other countries. If you read what happened, it said they t consumed a large amount, more than they should have, and that's what ended up killing them. And it wasn't just, hey, they took the recommended dosage. No, they took more than what was recommended, and it killed them. So when people talk about a concern of azdiractin, it's not a concern. You're not putting high doses of neem seed meal for your plants to even uptake it. You're not spraying a lot of neem on your plants for it to be a concern, so. Okay, that's good to know. So I asked you this question at the end of the last episode that we did together. 
I really want to ask it again because we have a lot of new folks that are joining. I mean, we filmed that episode a year ago. And between now and then, there's been a countless number of people who have just started gardening for the first time. So for those folks that are pretty new, maybe starting to use some of these organic inputs, these organic amendments, what advice do you have for them? Well, some of it's going to depend on if you're indoor or outdoor cultivating. Outdoor, um, you're going directly in the soil, so you're, you can have problems with pathogens right away. Indoor, you're, you're, you're getting a soil, you're kind of creating it, you're putting in different biology, so you kind of understand what's in there. So if I'm looking at amendments and I'm looking at both conditions, if I'm doing a, a big garden and I'm trying to prepare it, uh, I'm going to put down something that has some micro macronutrients, either like azomite or kelp. Kelp's going to give me some of the plant hormones that my, my seedlings are looking for to get started growing and to grow healthy, start shooting out and up and root growth. So kelp, like we were talking, is one of those super ones you would put up there. I would look at insect frass and not over guano because the protozoa. So you're getting the bacteria, the fungi, the protozoa, you're getting chitinase. You're getting stuff to kind of help the plants defend themselves, building the soil diversity as well. Because it is about soil diversity. The soil and the plant are one. They communicate. They talk. The plant actually eats up the biology and spits it out. That's a whole nother talk. And if you talk to Dr. James White, he could go into that. But So that would be two of them, would be insect frass and the kelp meal. You don't really need nitrogen. Some of these products have nitrogen. So when people are like, oh, I need nitrogen. you don't, I'm not so worried about nitrogen. These products have it. I don't need high amounts of nitrogen like I've been told for years by all these big ag companies. Oh, you need nitrogen, nitrogen. No, no, I don't. I don't need as much. I need it, but I don't need high amounts of it. Alfalfa meal would be a good one. Neem seed meal would probably be another good one um, if I was looking to add a couple. But I would find something that's not an all-in-one. I don't believe in the all-in-ones because a lot of people like Down Earth has BioLife, which is like five products in one. I don't quite believe in that. I believe doing it yourself so you're getting more instead of a, like – I can discuss that later. But humic acid, that's another one that would be up there in my super ones because – your plants are trying to create humus when they're breaking down this product. And the humus is retaining all the nutrients, all of your ion bonds, cations for the plant to take up. That's where it stores the energy. That's where it stores everything is in the humus, humic acid. So I would look at that because it's very beneficial for soil biology as well. Lots of good information there. So wrapping things up, how can the listeners find you? And what do you have upcoming in the future? Well. Uh, you can find me on YouTube and Instagram both. Uh, YouTube, just over 20 plus thousand followers, so it's been growing. Uh, we're, we're trying to do some changes with the channel. It's going to take a few months, um, but I want to make it more about a brand and not about me as a, the person. I want to get more content on there from other people in the industry, kind of like what you've been doing um, with some of your channels. But I want to get more scientists, people that are botanists, people, soil biologists, people that are really in the science of everything. Because a lot of people that follow me, we really try to turn you on to the science of things and give you just enough that you want to do the research yourself. Oh, I heard him talk about this. Oh, I heard so-and-so talk about, oh, well, maybe we need to look it up and see what this is really about. You know, like that's my job is to try to turn people on to that information. So I want to try to do more with it. I want to try to do more with my YouTube channel, try to get more information out and not just through me. I'll definitely be looking forward to that. I've learned so much from you in regards to organic gardening and uh, just the science behind 
the plant. And uh, I think it would be awesome to see you like interview or like have discussions with people who are on that level because I think you'd bring a ton of value. You do such a good job of taking that information and putting it into a form that's digestible to somebody who's pretty new, you know, without... And I try to do that, keeping it simple so it's easy to understand because there's a lot of big complex words and I'm like, oh my God, like how do you even <laughs> say that? You know, and I know that even me being an educated man, it's still easier for people to get it at the simplest form and move into something a little harder than trying to start off with harder information that they don't even understand. Yeah, it can be confusing and a lot of things can go over people's head. For sure. So I'm looking forward to that. I'll definitely have a link to your channel down in the YouTube description section below. If you're tuned in on one of the podcast platforms, just search for Medically Fit on YouTube and his channel will pop up. Lots of good information on there. Uh, If you enjoyed this episode, click that thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Every single weekend, I'm releasing a new Garden Talk podcast episode and I would love for you to tune in to future episodes. Medically Fit, once again, thank you so much for coming on the podcast once again, second time around. Uh, I am happy. Might need a, a third one, potentially, right? <laughs> if I create controversy over like Dr. Bruce Bugsby uh, comments I made, <laughs> we might be able to get a third one on here for sure. <laughs> yeah, we could definitely go down that because I know you had uh, quite a few things to say about that particular podcast that I did with him. And uh, yeah, maybe that would be a good episode for the next time around. It's kind of going over some of the things that you had thought that you didn't agree upon with him because there is uh i know you mentioned we won't get too deep into it we're closing things up here but uh you had pointed to some studies in regards to that that conflicts with some of the things they had mentioned so maybe we can go over that in the next episode yeah that might be pretty interesting for some of your viewers to really hear some of the information from another point absolutely all right everybody hope you enjoyed that one And I will see you in the next episode. Peace out.